Good morning and welcome to Macquarie Chapel Presbyterian Church. It's great to see you all here this morning in person and if you're joining us on the live stream, a warm welcome to you as well. We have uh, a few announcements about things that are happening in and around our church. Uh, just while those are coming up, couple of other things. I did mention a few a couple of weeks back that we had invited Chris back for a farewell this morning on the 28th. This is uh, technically Chris's uh, last Sunday with us. Um, Chris declined uh, the invitation to do that uh, and so we are also organising a gift for Chris uh, which we will be giving to Chris um, and Chris recognises that he's still in the area um, and that's uh, I guess essentially where Chris was at with it. Um, and so uh, encourage each of us individually uh, to reach out to Chris and to farewell Chris as appropriate uh, and we will be sending him something as well um, uh, but that's uh, apologies that uh, we're unable to have a farewell with Chris here this morning. A few other announcements as well and I don't seem to have control of my clicker this morning. You can go to the next one, thanks Julie. Uh, playtime happened here last Tuesday. Um, continue to pray for um, our playgroup, please, as uh, we um, yeah, get to know some of the local mums in the area through that. Thanks, Julie. Uh, we had another meeting of the choir last Thursday, and we are uh, continuing to make plans. And this Thursday, we are hoping to be able to have Andrew Dunk, who is the organist down at Ride Presbyterian Church uh, joining us to uh, go through hymns for next uh, Sunday as well. Um, I've also been handed this morning by the man who chooses the hymns, uh, hymns for the next month as well. Uh, and so we've got the opportunity, I love organisation, I wish I uh, had it myself, um, but uh, it means we've got something to be working through over the next month as well. Uh, thanks Julie. Uh, Gardening Maintenance Day happened yesterday. Thank you to those who came. Uh, we were able to do a number of things outside between rainy patches, though I think some of the time you were outside, Colin, it wasn't not raining. Um, but there was not much of not rain happening. Uh, but we did a, a lot of things inside the buildings as well. So thank you to those who were able to come along and help out. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and once again, just a reminder about small groups that are happening in and around our church. And if you would like to join one, uh, then please see Lisa. Or if you can't catch up with Lisa, please see me. We are looking at starting a daytime group. Uh, if that is of interest to you as a form of fellowship, as well as um, spending time, I guess, um, just walking the journey of life together uh, with other people um, in the light of uh, our relationship with Jesus, then, yeah, feel free to talk to me. Uh, or Lisa, thank you, Julie. The barista course is still happening. We have had a hiccup with the coffee machine. It does still make coffee, uh, but we do need to uh, a different water filter on it. That probably doesn't interest you uh, necessarily, but um, we've just uh, waiting before we can uh, do things properly with that. Thanks, Julie. Uh, once again, a reminder for gentlemen, if you'd like to be gathering with the rest of us at uh, Rowan Ben's place on the 12th of March, Please RSV Peter Rowan or myself on the 8th of March and Julie, our AGM, I believe that is Wednesday week and so that's coming up uh, very soon. And finally, we're praying for, okay that hasn't been updated from last week I don't think, that's okay, so off the top of my head I can't remember the details for the church we're going to pray for, so we'll skip that this week. Uh, that's it in the way of announcements. Our call to worship comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, and I'm sure it is a verse that is familiar to many of you. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time this morning that we can spend with one another and also with you. Heavenly Father, we give this time to you. We pray, Lord, that it would bring glory and honour to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, this morning, you do not have to wear a mask, but if you're more comfortable wearing a mask, that is absolutely fine. Uh, we're also asking people to sign in, but you do not have to. Uh, the QR code does no longer work, um, and uh, we're still asking people to uh, wipe down pews after you finished. If you wanted to have a hymn book, you would have had the opportunity of having one as you came in this morning. If you're happy looking on the screen, you prefer that to handling a hymn book, you can do that as well. But we are going to stand and sing our first hymn this morning, which is 429, if you do have a rejoice book, 429, which is when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Please join me in our prayer of service. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come before you today to humbly offer our adoration for your majesty and to confess our sins. We are full of admiration and awe of the order and beauty of the universe. You have wonderfully adorned heaven, earth, with the utmost possible abundance, variety and beauty. Like a large and splendid mansion, most exquisitely furnished. In us, you have exhibited the masterpiece of your creation. Man, alone among, amongst all living creatures on earth, has been granted the ability to reason, to probe the secrets of the universe, to make moral judgments, and to communicate values and knowledge from generation to another, one generation to another. 
by virtue of these divine gifts, created as we are in your image, we are beset by human frailties, not always acknowledged and acknowledging the commensurate responsibilities that attached to such potential and privilege. We admit that often our best endeavours are nullified by doubt, pride and self-interest. We above, we abuse our environment, pay scant regard to those in need. We are often judgmental of others, but do not apply the same standards to ourselves. Frequently, we overlook the privilege of your boundless mercy available to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. How often, when put to the test, do we take the Simon Peter principle? We are not, therefore, and threatened by arrest or prison as he was, only the shallow possible rejection of others. Often, in so doing, we compound our weakness by appearing to be shallow and insincere. Let us be reminded of the words of that old Sunday school hymn. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to state the Lord is ours and dare to make it known. When the heat is on, do not turn away. Turn round, turn up and speak out. This morning, we again humbly ask for your forgiveness and mercy. And we promise that we will endeavour in these days ahead to try harder to put into practice your teachings and pray for your assistance to do so. Join me now as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Uh, this morning our Bible reading is coming to us live by satellite uh, from Agnes's home and she's going to come up on screen very soon. There is a bit of ringing, Andy, as well. I'm not sure if you're picking that up from back there. Thanks, Julie. Today's Bible's reading is at Matthew chapter 17, 1 to 13, the Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus talked with him, Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes become, became as white as the light. Just then there they appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, 
Don't tell anyone what you have seen, until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciple asked him, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. This is today's reading. We're going to stand and sing again. Uh, this time 310, Brother, let me be your servant, let me be as Christ to you, 310. We're going to have a time of prayer, of praise and intercession. Uh, just before we do that, I'm sure many of you are aware of what has been happening on the world stage with regards to Russia and the Ukraine. Um, and it is a matter of great concern, um, and it's not a great thing to be happening uh, in any way, shape or form. Um, there's been a lot of stuff uh, through social media, media especially with regards to uh, the church in the Ukraine and Christians and followers of Jesus and um, there's certainly people of great faith there who some have remembered being under times of persecution as Christians previously um, in history and uh, they're potentially I guess um, facing or um, bracing themselves for that again. Um, but of course it's not just Christians, um, it's a shame that this is happening to humanity, that there is a loss of life and that things like uh, greed, uh, things just like how it is that one person can have such an influence on the lives of so many, uh, that's, just, that's just wrong. Um, so we're going to pray for that this morning, 
I'm probably not going to pray a lot of words around that. I'm probably going to give us the opportunity um, to say uh, our own prayers at that point as well if we'd like to. At the very least, if you're not sure what to do with that, maybe uh, it's, for me it's helpful sometimes to think about holding somebody or a group of people before God and allow him uh, to, to just know that that's what I'm doing. I'm bringing them before him. And so that's what we want to do today. Um, so let's pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, do give you most humble and hearty thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your incredible love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we ask you, give us the due sense of all of your mercies, that our hearts may be unendingly thankful. And that we might show forth your praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all of our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit to, all to be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we bring before you this morning some of the things that are on our hearts and on our minds. We recognise, Heavenly Father, that we are in a broken world and at this time as we look at the world stage we see that more than ever. And so, Heavenly Father, we bring before you the people of the Ukraine. We ask, Lord, for your strength and your peace and your presence for them. And we also ask, Lord, for your protection of them. At this time of uncertainty, at this time of pain and strife, at this time of conflict, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you would lift them up. And once again, we pray, Lord, that you would protect them. Lord, you are the God who looks out and has a heart for those who are in need, for those who are abused, and distressed for those who are made homeless and refugees for those who are the victims of conflict and war for the fatherless for those who are widowed Lord we recognize that you have a heart for those who are suffering in this situation and we ask Lord that you would act Heavenly Father, we realise that sometimes you encourage us to protect those who are vulnerable. In fact, you always encourage us to protect those who are vulnerable. We recognise that on this world stage, there is an opportunity here for leaders of other nations and other world organisations to make a stand against these atrocities and this evil. And so we pray, Lord, that you would give them courage. Lord, help them to know of your presence and help them to be convicted of what is right. And Heavenly Father, we also bring before you the leader of the Russian people. And we ask, Lord, that you would convict him of what is right and wrong. Lord, you know his heart better than we do. You know why it is that he wants to do this better than we do. And so, Lord, we ask that you would convict him. We ask that he would have a change of heart and that he would turn around. And Lord, just in these next few brief moments, we just lift the people of the Ukraine up before you. We lift them up to you because you know what is best for them. And ultimately, you are the only one with the strength, the courage, the conviction and the love and the grace 
to save them. And so we lift them up before you. Eternal light, who has folded back the curtain of darkness and caused the dawn of a new day to brighten the earth. We ask you to gladden our hearts with your light. Give us the light of faith, that doubts may be dispelled like the mists of the morning. Give us the radiance of hope, that we may reach forward to possess virtues we have admired from afar. Give us the illumination of love, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Heavenly Father, we bring our church before you this morning as well. And Heavenly Father, even though Chris uh, could not be with us for a farewell this morning, we do pray, Lord, that you would bless him and that you would go with him and that he would know your presence. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would bless him in his endeavours, in his role at St Albans now. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would also... Uh, Give him much joy in that. And we ask that you would also be with us here this morning. Um, Lord, encourage us and strengthen us as well. Be with us as a church. Um, Lord, be with those who are endeavouring to uh, continue as a choir as well and encourage us in song each Sunday morning as we worship you. Uh, Lord, be with us as we look for an organist as well. Lord, guide us and direct us. And we thank you once again for your church. And we thank you for that promise that you will build your church. And we bring all these things before you this morning. And we pray them in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing hymn 574. 574. um, Which... We haven't sung here a lot, I don't think, but it's one that I enjoy. Uh, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, 574. You're right. All good? Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Julie.
Please be seated. Thank you, Margaret. All right. I actually feel I have more oxygen that's gone to my brain right now. That was a good one to sing leading into so stop us going to sleep during the sermon. Uh, so we've had an interesting Bible reading for us this morning. And uh, just while we're waiting for the slides to come up, um, the title of the talk is This Is My Son, which is a declaration by the Father on that mountaintop experience uh, that we have. And Julie, you're looking for it and it's not there. It's actually not there. I'm sorry, that's completely slipped off the radar this morning. It's not there and I cannot give it to you quickly to give. It's on my laptop. Uh, and so I had some great pictures this morning. <laughs> if there was any week. Anyway, I was going to ask you if you'd heard that saying, stop and smell the roses. Uh, I had a lovely picture of a girl stopping and smelling roses. You can get that in your head, uh, that image. Um, but it's a common uh, sort of phrase that we've used that sometimes with life we can move quickly through life and we don't actually stop and take in the moments of life um, that are helpful moments to take in. Uh, we actually miss the beauty because with roses, one of the things of beauty with roses is that they have a fragrance. And you might see roses as you walk past, but stopping and smelling them means you stop, you pause, you slow down so as to make the most and get the most out of what is there. One of the realities for today is that a lot of people don't stop and enjoy the moment. I don't know if you've noticed, but if you go to a concert or a musical event, uh, there's lots of people there and what are they doing if they haven't been told specifically that they are not allowed to for legal reasons? They are on their phones filming it. They actually look through life, they look at life through their mobile phone. Um, they're capturing the moment, so busy capturing the moment that they are not in the moment. What is it that does not? Now, the interesting thing with phones and filming life rather than, especially life's big experience rather than just being there, is because then we can put it on social media. And there's almost this anxiety that if I'm there at a particular moment, I need to be able to prove it. Nobody reads a Facebook post that says, you know, I met Prince Charles and shook hands with him, or I had dinner with the Queen. I don't know if you'd film it if you're having dinner with the Queen. You probably wouldn't do that. But this idea that you can't just put that, you need to have a video so to show that you're actually there, to capture you in the moment. And yet this underlying anxiety or stress that maybe others won't believe you or won't understand what it really meant for you fully or it won't be as impressive. You've got to take a picture, you've got to take a video of it. Grandparents, you are of course exempt from this. You're allowed to video all you want as grandparents. That's okay. Well, verse 1, it says, Jesus led his disciples, not all of them, in fact, only three of them, Peter, James and John. He takes his closest three. Notice that. This isn't something that happens in front of a group of people. And we're told he takes them up onto a high mountain. Now, I had a map for you that shows Caesarea Philippi. And if you go this way on the map, and so that for you is northeast. I've got to reverse this. If you go northeast from Caesarea Philippi, you come to Mount Horeb. And it's a huge mountain. Now, there's two traditions as to which mountain Jesus walked up because it doesn't actually say uh, Tabor is the other one. If you look at Tabor, Tabor is a, a bump. It's, it's mildly impressive if you lived out west somewhere. It's a bump. But Mount Horeb, it has snow on it. And it's almost like a mountain range. It's long and thin. And the interesting thing is the, the Catholic tradition in particular says it's on Mount Tabor. And so they've built a monastery on there and everything. Well, it's a lot easier to build a monastery on that one than the other one, so why not have that as the one that you think he went up? But notice that it says that he went up to a quiet place where there weren't anybody, well, there wasn't anybody around. Mount Tabor, actually, at the time of Jesus, had people living on top of it, so it probably wasn't that one. Whereas Mount Horeb, it's, it's just 
like I said, it's got snow on top. It's desolate. And I had a, a, an amazing picture, uh, which I just can't share with you this morning, of a man standing on top, and it's like he's on top of the world. Um, we don't often think of mountains like this in the Middle East, um, but it's quite impressive. Uh, if you were to look at chapter 16, verse 13, it actually says at the, um, in chapter 16, verse 13, which is just the chapter before, um, that they were in uh, the province of Caesarea Philippi. So that actually puts them closer to Mount Horeb as well. And so I like to believe he went up onto Mount Horeb because it's impressive and it's amazing and it's huge. Now, we stopped the Bible reading at verse 13, didn't we? But if you were to go on to verse 21, you'll actually read that they come down from the mountain and on the way down from the mountain, uh, they're interrupted by somebody who's got a son who has a demon um, possession issue and some of the disciples have tried to cast the demon out and they didn't have any luck with it and so Jesus cast it out um, and there was this question why couldn't we do it and he talked about it being a matter of faith and this is where he says that, that amazing thing you, you've, you've all heard it haven't you where he says if you would have faith as small as a mustard seed you could say to this what mountain now just for a moment, he could have been on Mount Tamor and it would have been, wow, that's impressive, it's a big mountain. But on Mount Horeb, when he said, if you had faith this big, you could move this, whoa, it's very impressive. I think it's impressive to move any mountain by telling it to get up and go. But that's actually the context of that statement is on this amazing mountain. And so the first point that I want to make this morning is that there is this call to enjoy the view. I wish I had the pictures up to show you the view. It's an amazing view. So Jesus leads them up onto this high mountain to enjoy the view. And just for a moment there, something amazing happens up on that mountain and they've got the opportunity to enjoy the view. And do you think Peter stops and enjoys the view? Not particularly. You see, the, second, uh, the other thing that happens in this passage, and this is my second point, is that there is the Son in all of the Father's glory as he's transfigured on the mountain. Now, the interesting thing is if you were to go back to the two preceding verses to this passage, so chapter 16, verses 27 and 28, there's actually this little story, or this little hint, I should say, um, that Jesus gives to uh, those that he is talking to. Um, in 16, 27 and 28, he says, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. And I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, there's a lot of debate and argument as to what it is that Jesus is actually referring to there, but in all three Gospels, he makes that statement. In all three Gospels, he says, there's going to be some people here right now who are not even going to taste death and they're going to see it. And guess who was there when he said that? Peter, James and John. And in all three Gospels, the very next thing that happens, in fact, two of the Gospels say that it happens six days later and another Gospel says that it happens around about eight days later, which is a bit of a worry because I think that was Luke who was a doctor who said about eight days and that doesn't seem very good that a doctor would say, oh, take about eight milligrams of that. But anyway, the other two say it was six days. And it follows on straight after that, that the transfiguration actually occurs. And so whether Jesus is talking about the transfiguration or not, what we do suddenly see is this picture of Jesus in all his glory. He's transfigured before them. In verse 2, there he was, transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Um, it's in all three gospel, synoptic or gospel accounts. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. One of the other two gospel accounts says that he became, his clothes became whiter than anybody could bleach them. They became whiter than mum could have washed them. They became more than nappy sand white. It's almost like there is a light that is coming from the light of the world. 
It says his face shone like the sun. You can't look at the sun, can you? And so you can imagine James, uh, Peter, James and John covering their faces with this brightness of light. I remember when I, had, um, I met my first wallaby as somebody who loved playing rugby and loved watching the wallabies play. Um, and I actually, he was a, somebody who'd come from South Australia and he originally came to play super, uh, super rugby with, um, I think it was Cronulla had a super rugby team. Uh, Tian Strauss was his name, a South African. Uh, he played for the Springboks in South Africa and he came here and after Super Rugby stopped, he started playing for the Wallabies. And I met him at a barbecue and I got introduced to him and there was, for me, this was the first Wallaby I'd actually met. I stood next to a Wallaby. And to me, there was a, the light that shone from him and I didn't know what to say. I became quite anxious. I thought, what do you say? I want to ask him, what was it like to play for South Africa and for Australia? Um, at such a high level. Um, what's your favourite thing about rugby? Why do you enjoy rugby so much? Um, I wanted to talk to him about these things, but I couldn't. I just stood there awkwardly and said, hi. <laughs> I was worried that if I said anything, I might do what Peter does in this passage and say something stupid, something silly, something immature. Imagine being with the glorified Jesus. Imagine being with the glorified Jesus. I find it amazing to imagine being with Jesus, just as he walked on the road to Emmaus or yeah. whatever. But the glorified Jesus just goes up a notch. Um, but then the plot thickens in verse 3. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now this was more like another experience I had when I happened to be um, waiting for one of my children to come back from an overseas excursion that they went on. And while I was there, I didn't know this was going to happen, but I look up and one of the wallabies had arrived at the airport terminal. Um, they had been on tour in Europe and there he was. It was Steve Moore, the captain, the captain of the wallabies at that time. And I remember looking and... Uh, like going, oh, oh. And then I realised there was two cameras that were set up there ready to film the wallabies as they came. And so the first one comes, the captain comes, and then another one comes out, the vice captain, and another one comes out, and another one. And it's like, this is too overwhelming. And I thought back to my experience with Tian Strauss and not being able to say anything. And I thought, I really don't know what to say. I want to go up and talk to them, but I can't. There's not just one of them. It's the team. And here on the mountain, Jesus is transfigured. And there's this like, whoa, what is going on? But then we get not just the captain, but we get the vice captain. And we get the coach rock up as well. Moses and Elijah appear talking with Jesus. And for any New Testament era Jew... These are the heroes of faith. And so Peter and James and John witness something absolutely incredible, phenomenal. They see Jesus become glorified. And then they see Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah are chatting with Jesus. It's crazy. It's intimidating. What do you do? What do you say? Well, if you're never sure what to say in those situations, look at what Peter says next and don't do that. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Yes, it is, Peter. <laughs> he says, if you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What a strange thing to say. Now, there is some speculation that Peter was actually on the money. Because apparently, some people speculated that around that time would have been the Feast of Tabernacles. And the idea that Jesus has a dwell, sorry, that God has a dwelling place and that we have a dwelling place and we're dwelling with God. And so maybe he's thinking about that. He's actually going to make three little tabernacles. One for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But I sort of think I'm not sure if that is what is actually going on at all. 
But I do wonder if James and John just looked at Peter and went, Peter, shut up. I don't know if Moses and Elijah looked at Peter and said to Jesus, is that the Peter guy? Because Peter was sort of used to blurting things out in key moments. But have you ever been in that situation? Where it's something that's a little bit outside of your comprehension perhaps. Or it's a big moment. Or it's an important moment. You know it's important. And suddenly there's a lot of pressure on you. You may not even know where that pressure comes from. It sort of comes from within you sometimes. Sometimes it could be because other people look to you in that situation and want you to do something or ask you to do something. But there's this anxiety that builds up within you and the adrenaline gets going and I reckon Peter's adrenaline was going. And when your adrenaline goes, you know what shuts down, don't you? Your brain. And so... There's a guy, Joseph Grenny, who wrote a book about crucial conversations and where your adrenaline goes up and he defines, and I've talked about this before, defines what a crucial conversation is. The stakes are high, there's opposing opinions on it. And he said, what happens is adrenaline cuts in, your brain shuts down, and he says, when we need to do our best the most, we're actually not capable of doing our best. We bring our anxiety, we bring our adrenaline to the situation, but we haven't brought our brain. And so Peter, I think, is in one of those situations. Do you know in Mark's gospel, so in, in this gospel, it, it says that, um, that, uh, that Peter was, was afraid uh, as he was talking. Um, but then if you look in um, Mark's gospel, it says he did not know what he was saying. They were so frightened, it says. In Luke's gospel, it says he did not know what he was saying as well. Um, he didn't know what he was saying because his brain wasn't really working at that moment. He was just completely stressed out because he knew he was in the presence of Moses, Elijah, and a glorified Jesus. And he snaps. He doesn't really know what to do. Some people have said Peter was trying to capture the moment It was like his version of taking a photo of it. Let's make three dwellings and you guys can sit here and we can just have a commune up here and be here for yonks. We can just stay here and chill out. We don't have to go back down the mountain to the world. And so Peter starts babbling. But we get to the third point for this morning and that is the idea of simply sitting with the Son or sitting with the Father. You see, as as Peter is talking, it actually says that while he is still talking, uh, verse 5 says, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them and a voice from the cloud said. It's almost like God the Father. Peter's still going, hey, let's make some things. We'll make these. You can stay there. This one can be for you. This one can be for you, Elijah. And while he's still doing this, God the Father actually says, Peter, let me say what I need to say. And what does the Father say? He says, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. And I don't know if this last three words are actually directed um, at Peter as much as anybody else. But he says, listen to him. Don't listen to Peter. Listen to him. Why is it that in this we pick up anxiety from Peter? But if you notice, we don't pick up any from Jesus. And yet Jesus is at the centre of it all. I think if I was Jesus, my anxiety would go up. I don't want to be glorified and standing in front of I don't necessarily want to be talking to um, great people of faith from the Old Testament. I don't want to have um, Peter, James and John seeing me necessarily do this. Um, Some of us don't necessarily want that attention. Jesus, for all of his ministry, kept saying, don't tell people about who I am. On the way down from the mountain, from the transfiguration, he says to the disciples, don't tell anybody about this. And yet in that moment, he seems quite non-anxious, not fearful, not ashamed. 
and he gets a rap from his father which he could feel was pressure upon him to be a certain person, to do certain things. But he is just silent. And the father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And I guess my main point this morning is that we could all do with being more like Jesus at this point. Because the message that God the Father has for each and every one of us here is, here is my child in whom I'm well pleased. It's not a reason to be terrified or anxious or fearful or ashamed. But James and John actually joined Peter in unison with the next bit. In verse 6 it says the disciples end up face down terrified. And in verse 7 though, as they lie face down terrified, we're told that Jesus came and he touches them. And he says, get up. And he says, don't be afraid. In other words, Jesus comforts them. I did a Google search for the most common image when you Google comfort. And the most common image on Google for comfort is comfort fabric softener. But the second most is an image of physical touch. Um, namely, the most common one that comes up on Google image is the holding of somebody's hand. There's this physical touch, which is what we do when we comfort people. And here we have Jesus. He sees Peter, James and John in all of their fear and he goes, he moves towards them. And we're told, he says quite specifically, he touched them. And he says, get up. And he comforts them. He says, don't be afraid. It's funny because we're told to fear God and they've just had the biggest experience of God than anyone's ever likely to happen in this life. In fact, you're probably not going to have and Jesus' word is, don't be afraid. We've become so anxious and fearful in so many things in life. And it often drives us to say things that are not helpful. It certainly doesn't necessarily help us see other people as people who need help. And in this situation, Jesus is calmful, he's calm, he's peaceful, he is not anxious and afraid. And he's able to comfort those who are. It's amazing how if we can be, I guess, in that place in God where we realise that we are his child, dearly loved by him, we can actually be helpful to those around us like Jesus is here. We've talked about last few weeks about Jesus' compassion for the people. And here, Jesus has compassion on these guys. And in 1 John 4.18, it reminds us that perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. But in love, there is no fear of punishment. And Jesus understood that. He's been perfected by love. We haven't. That's a process we continue to go through. And so as I finish up, I just want to remind us of that I-thou relationship that we've talked about. Seeing other people as people. If we are anxious, if we've uh, got issues of shame coming up within us, if we are afraid... If we're worried about our own brokenness to a too great a degree, then it's very, very hard to be able to see other people in their times of need. And so how is it that we overcome that? One of the ways we overcome that is to remind ourselves each and every day that we have a Father in heaven who loves us, who is pleased that we are here. That is something that can help us in each and every situation. And so I have this vow that the next time I meet a wallaby, I'm going to remember that I am a dearly beloved child of the living God. And as one person likes to say, I stand in the unshakable kingdom that is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I'm hoping as I do that, that I'll be able to see the wallaby that I am in front of as another human being and not as some sort of demigod. 
and that I'll be able to speak to them as though they're a human being because do you know what, whether you play for the Wallabies or not, everybody needs to be treated like a human being. It doesn't help any of us to be treated in some sort of awe as some sort of God. And so I want to encourage us first and foremost to sit with our Heavenly Father each and every day reminding ourselves that we are dearly beloved by Him. That we might be helpful to those around us who are also dearly beloved by Him whether they realise it or not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing love for us. And this is a strange story that we've had this morning. It's a strange account of an interesting event. But Lord, if we were to take anything from it, I just pray, Lord, that it would be something that helps us to move towards you, to be able to sit and rest in you, as Jesus said, to be able to come to you and to rest be able to put aside our shame, our anxiety, our fears, to be able to be at peace in your presence, that we might be a presence of peace in the lives of those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing again. It's number 53. All people... I've got, or people, thee on earth, but I'm thinking that that's not right. It's that on earth do dwell. And so that's my typo there. All, all people that on earth do dwell. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> a plate for a retiring offering at the back. Soon we hope to be able to pass the plate around again. Let me uh, dedicate that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We also ask, Heavenly Father, that you would accept these gifts given freely to, use for, to you for the extension of your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all forevermore. Amen. Thank you.